Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we continue to go down aircraft that contributed to the air war on the Eastern Front, Craig. You had to be careful. You might get sent to the Eastern Front, which could be bad. Now, today, as we were kidding around, I got my uh, COVID booster shot. And of course, we're wearing my hat in honor of that. So I, I got my shot. I know it's, I'm in real trouble. And again, Greg, a deal's a deal. He picked the, the hat for me in honor of getting my COVID booster. But I know I'm in trouble when I put it on. And you don't see him, but he's laughing. So I, that's a really bad thing. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off and get, uh, get it tossed off camera. There we go. A little high arc there. Good catch by the Kenny. So today we are talking about the Tupolev, the ANT-40, the SB, which was a medium bomber in, uh, in Soviet Russia with the Russian Air Force. We're going to talk about that. Now, this aircraft, unlike some of the other ones that we've done, uh, was actually, Greg, it had a fairly high build rate. There were 6,656 of these built prior to the war and during the start of the war. We're going to explain what happened to them, but very high build rate. And one of the things that's interesting about the SB is in 1941, 94% of the Red Air Force's bomber fleet were SBs. So they were widely used on the Eastern Front. They came and went. We're going to talk about what happened to them. Now I'm going to go ahead and pick up uh, you know, we're, we're, we're more with a diminutive aircraft today, so I'm going to throw up a plan view. Greg can uh, throw up a plan view as well. Now, this aircraft, we have talked about twins that were destroyers, right? Which would be the BF-110 or the BA-88, uh, a Mosquito, maybe a Bristol uh, Bowfighter, something like that. That's not what this is. This is not a destroyer. This was a medium bomber in every sense of the word. It was not designed to mix it up with fighters. It was relatively fast. The first flight was in 1934. It was introduced in 1936. It had a top speed of 280 miles an hour. Now, think about that for a second. 280 miles an hour in 1934, when most everybody's flying biplanes or transitioning from biplanes to a low-wing all-metal model planes, fairly fast, but as the aircraft progressed, it was not uh, able to keep up with fighter technology uh, that was going on, and ultimately that would spell its demise as a frontline aircraft. Now, last week we talked about what happened in the Soviet Union if you didn't deliver the product without defects, right? We know about that. Well, this <laughs> aircraft was very similar in that the crews that tested this airplane when it was initially flight testing were so, how shall I use a technical term, pissed off about the performance and the defects in the airplane that they held up placards when the inspector of the Red Air Force came. So what ended up happening with that was the um, inspector went back and guess who he reported to, Craig? He reported to Uncle Joe. And Joseph Stalin said, there are no trivialities in aviation. That is a direct quote. So the designer, A.A. Arkhangeleski, Ark uh, nearly was forced, I'm going to put this down. Now, one thing we've done is every once in a while we get a product submission. This is from Alex. And Alex, we can throw up Alex's picture there. He sent me this. This is liquid death. And uh, of course, if you were not, Uncle Joe was not happy with you, Greg, what would happen? You might get a bullet or you would be forced to drink, to drink liquid death. So Alex, we appreciate this. It fits quite well with what went on. But what ended up happening was, fortunately for Tupolev, uh, Arkhangeleski was too important and they didn't take him out and shoot him. But this aircraft from the time it was introduced in 1936 was undergoing almost constant modifications on the assembly line. And that meant that there were having all kinds of teething problems with the airplane. So uh, it was not, it, with a lot of Soviet aircraft, and we're gonna talk about Lend-Lease in a minute, why 
the Russians, I think, were so happy to get a lot of Lend-Lease aircraft. Uh, the, the Soviets, with all of these designs at the beginning of the war, were having all kinds of problems with them. And this aircraft was no different. I cannot find that anyone was shot, Greg, or forced to drink liquid death uh, for any of those screw-ups. Uh, now, the aircraft was very, very prolific. This aircraft fought in the Spanish Civil War. It fought in China. It fought in Mongolia. It fought in the Winter War. And it also fought on the Eastern Front. Now, comparable aircraft would be a B-25, maybe, uh, a A-20 or an A-26. Now, the difference was this aircraft did not have the same performance envelope as it evolved uh, in the war. So those are sort of comparable airplanes, but, but the aircraft by 1941 was completely outclassed. And why was that? Well, there is a reason, Craig. And that reason is when Russia entered the war, they got started to get a lot of Lend-Lease material from the United States. And two things, one, the quality of the Lend-Lease gear, the American aircraft was pretty good, and the, it allowed the Russians really to retool and focus on armor, the T-34 and some of their heavy, heavy armor, uh, and, and also uh, retool on fighter production. So the Americans were, fly, were providing B-25s and other aircraft. Those aircraft picked up a lot of the pace in Lend-Lease. In fact, we're standing in front of one of the fighters here, the P-63 and the P-39 that went over there as well. So there was a number of aircraft being utilized that, that went over the land bridge, but they really helped the Russians create a capability that they were struggling with uh, as they grappled with the Battle of the Germans. Now, so what has Greg gone out and done for me today? Well, after four weeks of, I would probably equate to a gastric terrorism, which what was going on there. Some of that stuff was, was pretty bad. I have something today that might actually be not uh, totally repulsive, which is brownie caramel cream root beer soda. Now, the one concern I have, this label looks old, Greg. It looks very old, and there is no way I can see what's in there. It is cold, which is kind of nice. Uh, since 1929, Orca Beverage, Inc. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Uh, 170 calories, so not too bad. The rest of it is, uh, let's see, not a lot of sugar in it. You can't get a cash refund in California. So what I'm gonna do, Greg, is a leap of faith with a, even the top looks old, Greg. I'm a little concerned about this one. So we're gonna go ahead and pop this one. Oh, you, but you heard the fizz, so there actually was a charge to it. Greg's like, yeah, I heard that. All right. No repulsive. It smells like root beer. doesn't smell like diesel fuel like the last one. This isn't horrid, but it is gone. It has, it has, it has gone the way of, it's not liquid death. It's maybe more like liquid stomach ache, but it is definitely the promissory second sip. Mm. Yeah, that's not like absolutely disgusting, but, but it is definitely gone to the great soda warehouse in the sky. So the air, this aircraft, and by the way, this is really cool, Greg. We've never had an aircraft on skis, so that's actually really neat. Um, as I said, this aircraft fought in a numerous conflicts prior to the uh, really kind of starting to be withdrawn in 1941. Now, remember when I said there were 94% of the, of the Russian bomber force were SBs uh, in 1941? The reason for that was the Russians knew that this airplane was obsolete and that it had reached the zenith of its design, even with all the modifications I talked about. They built, though, with their, we've talked about, about before where the Russians were slamming everything into the line that they could think of to throw the Germans back or, or slow them down. The Russians built 4,000 of these. So remember, we talked about a build rate of 6,000. 
4,000 of these were built in 1941 because they were literally throwing them into the line against the, against the Germans. And so this, when you talk about a stopgap aircraft, this was completely a stopgap aircraft. Now, the interesting thing is about it, the Finns operated it uh, after the, or during the conflict. The Germans captured a bunch of them and used them during the war. So this is an uh, aircraft like we talked about with some of the Italian airplanes. The Luftwaffe actually flew these airplanes and these aircraft were retired in 1950 with the Spanish Air Force. So you could see how they kind of proliferated all over the place. Now, the sad part about it is, this is another one of those uh, pretty much extinct aircraft. Uh, in the 1950s, in the Soviet Union, they went and basically cleaned up the whole country. There was weapons everywhere laying around. They cleaned all that up, and what they did is they scrapped most of it because they needed it for consumer goods, building stuff. Guess what happened to these? They were pretty much all scrapped. There is only one of these on display in Russia, and that airplane, Greg, was actually, they went out to a mountain range where one came down in a mountain in a mountain pass and salvaged out of there to put it into a museum. So if you think about it, there were none of them left at that point. They'd all gone by the wayside. There's also a reproduction aircraft, one of these being built, but that's it. So there's one in on display. And by the way, if you see this and you know of another one of these SBs on display, I'd like to know that because I could not find any other aircraft. So when we talk about an extinct airplane from 6,000 to one copy and one reproduction, that's it. Now, if you want to, and I used to do this when I was a kid, this is actually a very cool uh, uh, thing, because when I was a kid, I don't know about you, Greg, I used to love to play soldiers. My, I would get my mom to buy these. Now, these are soldiers from all across the spectrum. Uh, you can get them and you can set them up and have them do whatever you want them to do. And uh, the other thing that would happen is, I remember as a kid, you would step on them or they would be eaten by the dog. And I, I can't tell you how many of these I would find, you know, mangled. Now, there is one thing in an electronic world, guess what these don't require? They do not require batteries, and there is no TV screen. This is an imagination. So click on that link, and Jason will send you one of these out right away, just in time for Christmas. Uh, now, if you have come across us on YouTube and you like what you see, subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on YouTube, leave a comment. We get comments all the time. If you see something or you know something about the airplanes that we're talking about, we'd love to chat with you. If you like us on Facebook, like us, uh, click that like button. You see the video on Facebook. And remember, we cannot do this without your donation. So click on that donation link. We, we fly our aircraft, a number of our aircraft. We can't keep them in the air, and we can't keep doing these historical reviews without your support. So we are very grateful if you give us a donation. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.